Hi, hello there, as a Star Wars reference. As you can see, my name is Gergely. Just call me Gary if you have any questions later. And this time on Hustaf, I will speak about test distributions, how to align your testing, how to improve your daily testing to maximize your quality uh, value and you know the product uh, capabilities. So before I move on this next slide, I would like to ask you: raise your hands if you ever use the term test distribution. Okay, not much. If I say, for example, testing pyramid, is that sound familiar? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Cool. Okay, we will speak about these and let's see our agenda for first. As the first appetizer, we will speak about the different test distributions because not only the testing pyramid is existing, and you will see what kind of test distributions you can utilize your daily testing. Also, at the second stage, we will reach our problem statement. Why different test, di test distributions are not suitable for us, what are the different challenges, problems that can arise during our working, and so on. And at the third stage, we will speak about lessons learned, what uh, my personal experience is in the industry in about 11 years, how we can improve our daily testing and the different test distribution in terms of our application and to maximize everything that we should deliver. So, what is test distribution? Because there were not many hands in the, in the air. So test distribution is all the test levels and everything that technically that the team is using the test during the testing. Let it be an approach. And the main importance is the multiplicity for the different test levels. Because, you know, if we look on the different test distributions, we have kind of many. I just show you four at the moment, but believe me, there are much more. On the left side, we have the traditional testing pyramid, where, you know, we are starting with a lot of unit testing, then moving on to the integration with a smaller amount, and of course, at the top, we have the UI testing in a few uh, number. So the goal here is to have as little UI testing as possible. The opposite of that is the inverted pyramid, where we, spare, well, we spend very little Mm, effort on unit testing, but much more on the higher levels. Of course, we have, well, the ice cone pyramid as the third, where we add uh, manual testing on top of everything. This is a very traditional case in terms of, let's see, legacy applications, for example. And also, at the left, uh, right side, we have the R-glass distribution, where, you know, we spend as much unit testing as it is possible, but very few on the integration and as much on the UI testing uh, level as we can. You can ask me, why, why are there uh, so much test distributions and which test distribution is your type, which you should use? Well, the answer is, it depends on you, and we will reach on the next slide about that. Since everybody is hyped about the testing pyramid because it's the most common test distribution and it is the best practice in the agile world that, uh, that should be followed, let's see the problems with the testing pyramid, which are, in my opinion, very big problems. First of all, it gives false expectations and targets. And also, due to these, it ignores the characteristics of the system under test. Why is that? Imagine your application. You have a huge mobile application with a, heavy, with a very severe UI, lots of animations, tons of interactions, and so on. You cannot do traditional testing in that case. I mean, you cannot use the traditional testing pyramid in that case, because you, you need to make sure that your UI is tested, because this will be the surface that the, UI, that the user will follow and use in their daily interactions. And also, if we are speaking about the traditional testing pyramid, it ignores the testing principles because, you know, you are trying to, let's say, follow a shape. You want to have a perfect testing pyramid. You want to have the perfect pyramid shape, which is impossible because, you know, you need to have context-dependent testing. You remember the ISTQB testing principles from the foundation level, as I recall. And, you know, since we have these characteristics, let's say it's not a silver bullet because it cannot solve everything for us. It gives just a recommendation for us how we should utilize the testing, but 
we should utilize it in terms of our application. So we need to be conscious about how we align our testing and where we do it, because we can follow the best practices, but it won't solve us the problems if we ignore the problems itself, because we want to, follow, we want to just follow the best practices itself. So we reach the main question. How can we achieve better test distribution, more accurate testing, and higher quality overall? Well, I will give you a very traditional answer, communication and planning. I will speak about that now. So co why communication? I know it's kind of a BS that communication is the main key to achieve better testing. But think about it. If you know your application, if you know your requirements, if you know your user expectations, you can have more focused testing, much proper coverage, and much proper effort alignment uh, based on this. And it goes back to the second picture, which is the blueprint. So based on the communication with different stakeholders, let it be a product owner, a business responsible, a, an end user, or whatever person, you can get different perspectives, and based on these perspectives, you can, base, you can build your blueprint, your foundation for testing, which can be improved step by step. If we are working in Agile, because I guess you all work in an Agile world, you can improve it sprint by sprint, or, or any time when you have the effort and the time to do that. So it's very important to have communication, because you know if we have common understanding on the goals, we can have better um, customer satisfaction as well, because we know what the customer wants, and we can deliver it as it should be. For that, I used the 6W method recently in our daily work with my team. And this method is based around six very easy questions. You can see these, and don't be fooled about the how. It doesn't start with the W but it ends with it, and this is the reason why it's a 6W method. It is very similar to the risk-based testing, where you try to mitigate and identify the different risks by, well, let's say, creating responsible persons, action plans, and so on, how to avoid the different risks and their occurrence. Um, yeah. And uh, if you are using that technique, well, if you answer all the questions properly, not just uh, partially, then we reach a strategy, even a test automation strategy, if we are speaking about test automation in our actual team as well. And this is the most important thing, because if you don't have a test strategy or a strategy at all for the testing, well, good luck with that. You will have something, but not the best uh, res uh, results. And uh, if you have the strategy, I mean, you know what you should done, how you should done, why you should done it, and so on then you can have your perfect strategy and deliver the maximized efforts that is expected from you and your team. Also, back to communication and to the 6W method. When can we use it? Technically, anytime. But in this slide, I speak about the refinement meetings, or you may call it grooming meetings with the developments and uh, the business per persons. So, in these meetings, if you ask these six very easy questions in terms of quality, then you can also enhance the testability itself. Because, well, let's say you are um, automating a UI-based application, an Angular application, a web application, for example, and uh, you want to have stable test automation. In the refinement meetings, when you are starting to groom and define a new user story, you can identify the different components for test automation, which should have a unique ID or a data ID or any CSS value that makes the test automation easier and more stable instead of relying on XPaths and different selectors, which can change due to time. And due to that, of course, your scripts can fail. Also, which is very important, think about the test data itself. Because it's really great that you have the defined expectations from the customer side, from the vendor side, that you need to deliver something. But if you, have, if you don't have the data for that, let's say, well, I work in finance. If you don't have a given account type, a given account number for doing a certain testing, well, even if the, uh, the story is delivered, the feature is delivered, if we cannot test it, it's not delivered. It cannot be released. So, 
This is important to think about the test data. And if we communicate and plan ahead, then we can have these data available when the development starts at latest or even before, because we are thinking ahead, we are communicating, we are trying to solve the issues, the risks should be mitigated. Yeah, let's move on. Let's see the testing process, because it's, let's uh, switch to the more technical part uh, instead of communication, because we can, we can improve there as well. Instead of shapes and context, think about your application. So if you ask me, I would say that you should think about the context of your application instead of the test distribution shape. It can be either an ice cone, an inverted pyramid, whatever test distribution that you choose. You choose it because you need that test distribution, based on a reason, not just a hinge or something, uh, a wild guess, for example. And when we are speaking about these, keep that in mind. The, te the ideal testing pyramid, you know, the perfect testing pyramid, is very, very expensive because you need to align your testing in time and effort as well, and you need to make sure that it is possible, but it may be un unreachable in terms of, for example, big UI-based applications, which I mentioned that it, it cannot be. Well, you cannot have the perfect pyramid in that case. And also, there are other aspects as well that you need to consider during uh, when you distribute your tests, like the timeline, the team size, for example, the given experience or the environment and the visibility of the feature. For example, you are working on different um, squads with different squads or even with different tribes in the Agile world if we are speaking about, uh, speaking about the traditional Spotify model, for example. You need to make sure that it is visible for the other tribe or the other squad that your feature is ready, it is ready to consume and so on because you can be the provider or you can be even the consumer. And if you don't know what happens at the other side or even at your side, well, it's a very big problem. And believe me, that should be mitigated as well. So back to the topic, we should always be uh, up to date about what is our expectations and what are the needs and uh, the type of our application to make sure that we have the perfect context and the perfect testing alignment based on that. And of course, where there is always room to improve, unit testing. You might not agree on that, but in my opinion, unit testing is overrated because, you know, we try to, hi we try to chase a high number of coverage. Let's say, for example, 80 percentage of coverage. But what is the message for the test management, for example, this 80 percent message? Is it good? Is it sufficient? Is it an actual result that we can say that mm -hmm, we are confident based on that? No, not really, because these are just red-green uh, results and the number. Nothing about the actual coverage, which features, which methods, and other things. That would give actual message for the test management side and for the responsible uh, decision makers about the actual quality itself. So instead of quality, I mean, uh, uh, sorry, quality above quantity. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I just mixed it. So instead of chasing high number of coverage, I would say that we should spend less effort on unit testing because uh, we can do much more ideal testing, which, much, which are much more beneficial. I will just move on that later. And uh, we will speak about these as well. Also, TDD is a very good experience and a very good approach to do unit testing. But it takes time and it needs expertise to do it properly, which is our biggest enemy during the sprint development. So yeah, it's also a thing that should be kept in mind. But let's see what we can do instead of doing uh, lots of unit testing, which might hold much more reason and value for the test management side and the decision makers, is component and contract testing. Because here you can have a perfectly informative message about the actual features and the results and the actual coverage, because here you don't have just numbers and method names, for example. You have descriptions for the different tests. You have test, test cases, test references, even to the test management system, if you are using a tra requirement traceability matrix, for example. So yeah. And also, what is the most important thing, in my opinion, that it is a very good approach to reach unreachable cases. 
For example, you have a legacy application, which is not under your control, and you need data from it. But it's under, let's say, the deployment, or it has an issue, it's, it's offline. Then, well, technically, your testing is screwed. You cannot do the integrated way, but you need to process, because time is your biggest enemy. And you need to show at the end of the sprint that everything is done. In that case, the developers can do mocked integration testings, for example, to see what happens if we get the expected contract, the expected result from the provider system. And uh, at our side, is everything working perfectly or not? And it is a very good approach for early testing, for shift left. Because you shift left the testing earlier. <coughs> Sorry. Ah. Ah. So yeah, you shift left the testing, and you have earlier results. And earlier results give faster feedback and much more confidence that at the start, <coughs> sorry, you have the proper testing and the proper results <coughs> that you should deliver. Oh. OK. Ah. Sorry, I have a short throat, and <laughs> it hits. <coughs> So the last point where we can improve, as always, is UI-based testing. As I mentioned, it is a very underrated place. But we have other things as well that we have to pay for that. <clears throat> for example, as I've written there, there is always a price for a fancy interface. And to do that, oh, Jesus Christ, <laughs> sorry. So yeah, OK, let's make it much more comfy. Ah, whatever. So. Back to the topic. <clears throat> you need to test your application on the higher level as well that the customer will see, because it is the most important place. And of course, you can say that you are testing on service level or API level, your different applications. But these kind of tests does not count with proxies, with firewalls, with different NGINX services, and so on, with server, server configurations. And this is the reason why you need to have some kind of production testing as well. You know, shift right. Let's say, for example, A-B testing or whatever. Testing on a certain node in the production that it's working, and you can safely deploy all the other nodes as well in the re, uh, later stage. So yeah. UI-based testing is very underrated, and it should be changed. Of course, you can say that, OK, it's slow. It should be not as much. But for that, we have parallel uh, solutions. For example, Selenium or any kind of tool can do parallel testing if you plan it. And this is going back to communication again. If you have multiple test data that can be used parallel, then you can do parallel testing, and you can speed up your testing. <coughs> All right, so we reached the summary at the end of the presentation, and let's see what, here, what we have spoken about. <clears throat> First of all, testing is context dependent. This is the main takeaway from my presentation that you should always keep your head around the system under test and its context, and choose the proper test distribution based on that. Again, another thing, do not think by the book. Do not ignore your feelings, your your thinking, your, mm, your uh, aspects, and, uh, and on. Because you are the end users, and you are the testers of the application. You have the most experience about it, and you need to tailor your testing based on these experiences to have it maximized. So yeah, optimize your test efforts. And as always, communication is our best way to improve. As I mentioned, if we speak and we discuss things, then we can trust that we have the mitigated plans, we have the risk mitigations, and so on. And also, it gives stronger collaboration between different stakeholders, let it be a business person, a developer, or a QA. And the common goal and target gives the quali 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 sorry, clarity on the quality as well. So thank you for your attention, and sorry for this kind of intervention. <laughs> and I'm ready to answer your questions. Thank you very much. But are you ready? Because I just wanted to ask that. Hmm? Do you have enough strength? I mean, your voice. Can you answer the questions? Mm -hmm. Or, OK, drink a rest a bit? Yeah. Drink? <laughs> <laughs> Poor yeah, you. Yeah, I can answer. Thank you. It's a hard job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. OK, so let's see the questions. Which test pyramid shape is ideal for your projects, and why? 
Yeah, that's a very good question. And I can, again, repeat myself from the presentation. That is, there are the different test distributions. And I would like to drop the pyramid and the shape things. It, it depends on your application, because testing is context dependent. So I won't tell you which test distribution to use, because I cannot tell you. I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, able to do that, because it's always depending on your application. It's always context dependent. I hope that answers the question. And you're just getting more and more questions. <laughs> you just had two. Now we have three. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I mean, three more. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So what are the main challenges regarding test distribution in the banking sector nowadays? That's a very good question. Uh, well, first of all, since we have very limited data due to regulations and different kind of uh, restrictions internationally or just locally here in Hungary, it is very hard to find um, test data for all kinds of situations. And based on these, it's very easy to say that the best approach for banking or finance, let's say finance, uh, is to use as much mocked integration testing and unit testing as it is possible, because there the de developers can give early feedback for us, can check that the requirements that we had and we had defined is perfectly met. And based on this, if we have that safety line, then we can, well, search for different test data and try the integrated one as well, the integrated test as well, to see if everything is working perfectly or not. So yeah, the test data and based on that, the test distribution is the main uh, hindrance, let's say. The test data is the main hindrance for having a good test distribution most of the time. We have lovely people here, great audience with great questions. In the real world, where the time to market much more important than the perfect produ product, how can we improve our quality? I like that question because it again reflects back that early testing and shift left is very Im uh, important for us. And you know, you don't have to deliver the perfect thing. You can have always iterations to make, to tailor it and make it even and even better, better, more stable. First of all, you need to have a stable thing to deliver that, uh, that satisfies the customer in every way. And then you can always think about uh, improvements, like how to make it more simple and more clear, how to make it more accessible for people, and so on. And yeah, I think this is, <laughs> this is the important. I think we have time for one more or maybe both of the questions. How would you tell a developer focused on UI testing instead of unit? Most of the time, actually, I don't have to tell them because they do their unit testing most of the time and they say, we are done. It's up to you. <laughs> sure, that's always an approach, but fortunately, with my team, I was able to educate them. And uh, generally, we time to time do a walkthrough about the unit tests. What, we are, what do they cover? How much do they cover? In what depths they cover? And based on that, we can move on forward with the UI testing. Because you know, if they have their unit tests, or even if they have their component tests, that is a very fortunate case in my, uh, in my project that we have these as well, then they are also depending on, for example, the different CSS selectors and the unique IDs for test automation, because we are kind of use the same thing and doing the same thing. So I don't have to <laughs> tell the developers when, when to focus on UI testing, because they are trained and uh, educated to do that without the need uh, to request. Would you like to answer for that last question? Sure. OK. How can you create test data, for example, bank data, on test staging environment? A very good question. It depends on the actual test data. What kind of test data do we need? If we are needing a new customer, for example, without any bank account or give any special information or uh, characteristics, then we can add it into the database through API calls and so on. So technically, for the easy cases, we can do that. But if we need special accounts, like uh, mortgage accounts and different kind of uh, uh, retail accounts or uh, corporate accounts, that is any other topic. Because most of the time, the easiest way 
to have uh, this kind of data is to move them from production, depersonalize it, and then add it to the staging or test environment, which is a very time-consuming uh, approach, but sadly, there is no easier approach most of the time for us.